Thank you. Jade, thank you for everything. And special congratulations are due not only for putting together a spectacular aromatherapy conference, but for doing it in a fragrance-free environment. <laughs> That's a first. Uh, obviously, a, a very auspicious sign. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> my anxiety started at 9 a.m. <laughs> when I started uh, listening to Dr. Schnabel. <laughs> and I realized that the first half of his presentation covered the first half of mine. <laughs> and my anxiety got worse when the next speaker, Annette Davis, covered the rest of my presentation. <laughs> So, are there any questions? <laughs> okay, so, <clears throat> for those of you who are possibly new to the world of aromatherapy, I'd like to introduce you to one of the tools of our trade, a perfume strip. Uh, we use this to help us study essential oils. So you might think this is done with our olfactory sense because we bring it to our nostrils and inhale it. But really it's more accurate to say that the study is done with our mind. Because if we're not paying attention to the information that is flowing in through any of our sense organs, it can arise and dissolve without us even noticing. So one of the interesting things about aromatherapy is that we don't actually need to pay attention for the aromas to be therapeutic. However, if we want to understand the substances, the medicines that we're working with, we need to study them not just intellectually, but in an experiential and uh, sensorial way. And like all of our sensory experiences, the more fully attentive we are, the more they reveal themselves to us. And so we put a few drops of oil on the strip and we bring it to our nostrils and we inhale it mindfully and it begins to reveal itself. And over time with study and contemplation, uh, we learned that many processes of life have made it possible for the oil to come to us. And many more processes continue as we inhale it. And if we were able to see the entire process, we would know that this oil originates within the sun and reaches its fulfillment in our awareness. Light evolves into consciousness. The sun's light flows into the atmosphere and across the surface of the earth. It could fall on a planet that was entirely stone or gas, or ice, or fire, and it would never find its way into any form of living consciousness through which it could perceive itself. Instead, it falls on this most perfect of worlds, where eons of time made the elements harmonic, and out of that harmony, the photosynthetic beings emerged. Now the sunlight falls on the earth's blue and green surface, and the plants harvest it with their upturned hands. Plants descend from ancient ancestral lineages, and their role in life is agents of nature's self-organizing intelligence. Day after day, year after year, generation after generation, the sunlight awakens their abilities to synthesize molecules out of air and water. In the process, they regulate the elements of the biosphere. Then, through human labor, the plants are cultivated and harvested and processed into foods and medicines and essential oils. We bring the foods and herbs to our tongue and the perfume strip to our nostrils and our cells recognize the tastes and fragrances as the flavors and aromas of light 
because metabolism is combustion of sunlight that has reached us across the bridge of plants. And then there is more. As we inhale, the chemical energy of aromatic molecules is converted in the enzymatic fires of the olfactory receptor sites into neurological currents that flow inward to the brain. Finally, somewhere in the mysterious interface between mind and matter, this neurological energy, which was once aromatic molecules in a plant, which were once rays of sunlight, arises as a perception of fragrance. So this talk is titled Essential Oils as Botanical Intelligence, but botanical intelligence is only a part of the discussion. If we understand the stages of how light evolves into plants and then into our metabolism and then into our consciousness, it is impossible to say where intelligence begins and ends. In reality, it's all intelligent and much more than we are because it is a profound life-giving and life-sustaining intelligence. So its nature is sacredness. And for me, this is the primary reason I've been interested in medicinal plants and healing for so long. So as you learned, an essential oil is a hydrophobic liquid composed of aromatic molecules. These compounds are synthesized in plants through what are called secondary metabolic pathways. And for those of us, including myself, who may not be familiar with the concept, a metabolic pathway is a genetically coded sequence of enzymatic reactions that synthesize a final compound from precursor molecules. For example, the biosynthesis of menthol in peppermint follows an eight-step enzymatic process. The genetics that determine this process have been decoded, and you know what that means for the future of peppermint oil. Primary metabolism in plants is responsible for regulating fundamental life processes of growth and development, including carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, chlorophyll, and building and maintaining cells. Secondary metabolism creates compounds that have diverse functions that are supportive of primary metabolism, such as hormonal regulation, immune protection, and helping plants adapt to changes in conditions of water, light, and soil. There are about 170,000 plant secondary metabolic compounds that are known, but the number is undoubtedly much higher. This is a well-known and popular secondary metabolite, caffeine. Humans use secondary metabolites for a number of purposes, including medicines and recreational drugs. Cocaine, for example, is produced by the coca plant as an insecticide that kills through a neurochemical mechanism similar to the one that intoxicates humans. So, that probably means that insects die from euphoria. <laughs> For the purposes of this talk, I would define the term botanical intelligence as the evolutionary development of secondary metabolism over an unimaginably long period of time and the ability that these compounds give plants to adapt to a multitude of complex and ever-changing environmental factors. So what is the biological purpose of essential oils? Why do plants produce them and what does this have to do with us? Essential oils have a range of biological functions in plants. Some are well known, but undoubtedly there's a lot to discover. The ones that are known include immunological protection against microbial pathogens, signaling to pollinators, and beneficial protective insects, symbiotes, protection against invasion by other plants, and repelling herbivores. So basically, attracting, repelling, and communicating. An essential oil, therefore, is distilled evolutionary intelligence in molecular form. 
Some, like the conifer oils, are primarily immunological intelligence. Others, like flowers, are primarily reproductive intelligence. All of them are the intelligence of interspecies communication. And so here we can ask a simple and obvious question. How intelligent is this intelligence? Just how smart are plants? The proof is in their longevity. There are new hybrid plants that appear all the time, but most plant species have been here for millions of years, which is a lot of droughts <coughs> and floods and ice ages and insect infestations and predators and microbial battles. Do you think we will do as well as the rose, which has been here 35 million years? It would do us well, therefore, to consider what we might learn from plants and to compare the kind of ancient ecological intelligence they have against the anthropocentric cleverness that we are so proud of. Let's consider how plants have approached the problem of microbes and predatory insects versus how we humans, us humans have. Plants use a strategy of passive defense armed with a broad diversity of compounds. Humans use a strategy of aggressive offense armed with a specific molecule. Plants use a strategy of symbiosis. Humans use a strategy of domination. The results speak for themselves. Plants have survived for eons, while in a few short generations we have reached a point of diminishing returns and increasing losses in our war against the superbugs and superweeds that we have created. <clears throat> when it comes to adaptive immunity, we are learning that even creatures without brains are more intelligent than the scientists at Monsanto. <laughs> the most important difference between botanical medicine including aromatherapy and allopathic pharmaceutical medicine is that the therapeutic actions of plants are due to synergies of compounds that act on multiple target sites and physiological functions rather than single compounds with xenobiotic or toxic side effects. Essential oils, like herbs, are composed of hundreds of individual compounds that work synergistically to produce long-term immunological protection and decrease the likelihood of microbial resistance. Now, in order to understand how these compounds of botanical immunological intelligence can be beneficial for us, we need to understand the similarities between plants and humans. In order to understand how plants and humans are similar anatomically and physiologically, we must understand that Homo sapiens have appeared only recently in planetary history and that we came out of ecological conditions created by an immensely long history of plant activity that shaped and created the biosphere that we appeared in. A simple way of saying this is that the plants came first, that they have been here a long time before we arrived, and that they terraformed the surface of the earth so the elemental conditions could exist for higher life to emerge. The most dramatic acceleration of this process was the appearance of the first flower about 140 million years ago, followed by the angiosperms taking over the earth. This created, essentially, an oxygen-rich planet of flowers. From this came the soil fertility, atmospheric conditions, and the food chain that led to an explosion of biodiversity, first of pollinators and then of higher life. The poetic and the mythological way to describe this is to say that we came from flowers. The biological way to say it is that we are made in the image of plants, or in the case of photosynthesis and human metabolism, a mirror image. We have a skeleton, they have tubules and filaments. We have skin nourished by oil, they secrete waxy substances. 
We have blood vessels. They have xylem. We have sperm and ova. They have pollen and ovaries. Plant metabolism is governed by hormones, as is human metabolism. We both suffer from oxidative stress and free radical damage and produce antioxidants in response. We both operate on glutathione. Both plants and humans suffer from infections by viruses, bacteria, fungi, and parasites. We both have complex immune systems, and we both react to illness and pathogens with activation of defense mechanisms that are remarkably similar. It's not difficult to understand the possibility that since we originally appeared in a world created and dominated by plants, are biologically dependent on them, and have such remarkable similarities to them that the compounds they produce for their life purposes could also help us. Herbal medicine in general, including aromatherapy, can therefore be said to be the practice of applying the compounds the plants produce for their own immunological, nutritional, and reproductive benefits for our own. Now, let's <clears throat> examine some of the major influences that go into the creation of an essential oil. These influences are in every oil and determine its quality and characteristics. There are two important reasons we should learn to identify and recognize these influences. The first is for the practical purpose of knowing what is in the oil, whether it is good or not, and what its therapeutic effects may be. The second is for the spiritual purpose of perceiving and appreciating essential oils as expressions of botanical and cosmological intelligence. And so I will mention in regard to the second point that in my opinion, even though we have been using plants and foods and medicines since the beginning, that we have yet to realize their highest purpose. We know certain things about the uses of essential oils, such as their antimicrobial, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory functions, and so on. But I think this is only the beginning of the story, and that we have yet to discover and understand what they are really for. So our first topic is the sun. The sun lives in every plant, and every essential oil is partly distilled sunlight both as the photosynthetic energy behind all metabolic processes as well as inside the fire during the distillation. The effects of sunlight are very diverse, including the daily diurnal cycle, growth phases of the plants, heat and light intensity, and many others. I'll just mention a few briefly, and we'll return to this broad subject in some other sections. The cyclical production of aromatic compounds following the diurnal rhythm is the most obvious example of the effect of sunlight. And what this means is that the levels of the compounds produced in a plant go up and down during the day and at night. And this has been reported in modern research for a number of species, including essential oils and aromatic plants, and ethnobotanical traditions also contain this knowledge and experience about the cycles of the plant potencies and the best time, therefore, to harvest them. Many plants produce peak concentrations of specific compounds at noon during the highest intensity of sunlight. However, fluctuations can be expressed at any time of day or night, such as peak production of carvacrol at 10 in the morning in some oregano species, Furthermore, even within the same species, different, different peaks of different compounds can occur at different times, such as the peak production of thymol at midnight in the same oregano species. What's important here is that the peaks occur daily and so are related to the sun. The stages of a plant's growth and development strongly influence the levels of therapeutic compounds. Budding and flowering stages, in particular, tend to produce maximum levels of many compounds in many aromatic plants. However, like the diurnal, the daily solar fluctuations, 
budding and flowering phases may simultaneously increase some compounds and decrease others. Flowering is a response to changes in the length of day and night that is controlled by the inner circadian clock of the plants. What's interesting about this is that we find another parallel between humans and plants, and that is that the circadian clocks of both are both controlled by melatonin. So the way we can think about the influences of sunlight inside essential oils, therefore, is like overlapping waves and rhythms with the more rapid daily cycle revolving inside the longer seasonal cycles of budding, flowering, and fruiting. So at this point, I'm going to take a little medical and political tangent here. And I'm going to change the subject from the influence of the sun on plants to its manifestations in the body. Specifically, we can look at how Chinese and Ayurvedic medicine would classify essential oils according to their elemental and energetic nature. And the reason that this is important is because of safety concerns with the uses of essential oils. You are aware there are safety concerns. Okay. A lot of people aren't. You are aware that a lot of people are not aware. Okay. So we know how much other people don't know. Classical <laughs> medical systems Classical med and this is important, and I will explain. Classical medical systems as Ayurveda categorize the effects of foods, herbs, and treatments into functional groups based on their empirical physiological functions. Therefore, herbs, foods, and treatments that produce a heating and a stimulating effect would be classified as being rich in yang, or fire influences, or the solar energy of Agni. Because of their highly concentrated form, the use of many species of essential oils carries a risk of causing inflammatory reactions on the skin and in the gastric mucosa and mucous membranes in, membranes in general. How many of you learned that the hard way? Okay. And the reason I am mentioning this is because, in my opinion, the greatest danger facing the until now unregulated practice of aromatherapy is irresponsible marketing that advocates general consumption of essential oils without any education about the potential toxicity or diagnostic knowledge of differences in individual tolerance. This kind of marketing is a public health hazard and it is harming people and harming people will damage the reputation of this form of healing and may reach a point requiring regulation, as has happened with other abused natural products. So we can see empirically that when people become inflamed by improper use of oils, that we're dealing with the concentrated power of the sun. And all of us have a responsibility to be educated and to educate others about the safe use of the oils, knowing that we are dealing with a form of herbal medicine that is much more potent than the more biocompatible uses of most herbal products. Okay, so thank you for your patience. That's my political statement. <clears throat> now let's talk about the moon. The influence on, of the moon on plants is more subtle and mysterious. And so it's more difficult to define what it does to the essential oils. But I can sum up a few things I have learned. There are reports that the influence of the moon on plants is stronger at the equator, but I have not been able to clarify yet what the mechanism is. The moon exerts its influence through its light, which creates low-level photosynthetic, photosynthetic activity in the plants. Some plants have developed ways of protecting themselves from moonlight so they can get a good night of sleep. Ethnobotanical traditions from different times and places around the world are full of observations that indigenous people have made about the effect of the moon on plants. Some of these include harvesting palm leaves at the full moon for the strongest leaves, harvesting bamboo at the new moon for longevity, 
harvesting trees around the new moon for drier and higher quality wood, training vanilla vines on the new moon because they don't break as easily from their water content. The common theme in all these observations is that the full moon has the effect of increasing water within plant tissues. Modern research has confirmed that indigenous people know things. <laughs> there are two anecdotal stories that I can share that are related to the influence of the moon, which I have not been able to confirm with documentation in the scientific literature. The first is from one of my mentors in India who claims that the morning of the full moon, when the sun is rising and the full moon is setting, is the most energetic and powerful time for the production of aromatic molecules in flowers. Since the emission of floral molecules is biorhythmic, this is entirely plausible, and it's also possible that the research has been done, but I haven't found it. The second is a report from Ecuador, where it is common knowledge among distillers of Palo Santo wood that the yield of oil is much higher around the full moon. In this case, some experimentation has been done and it has been found that the lower yield around new moon can be partially overcome with adjustments of the distillation equipment. So it might be partly explained as a gravitational effect of the moon at the equator. The remaining is a mystery, but Palo Santo is surrounded by many mysteries. So like some of the spicy and highly irritant oils that can be easily associated with the fiery element of sunlight, there are some oils that have more qualities that Chinese and Ayurvedic medicine would classify as yin and lunar. And the therapeutic effects of rose oil, for example, almost perfectly describe how Ayurveda views the effect of soma, moonlight. Cooling, relaxing, nutritive, sensual, and aphrodisiac. Most of the flower oils can be described as having these cooling qualities. So now let's talk about the influence of the seasons. The waxing and waning influences of the sun and moon are present in every oil as the changing seasons and their effects on the plant. In some locations, such as the northern latitudes, the winter is the limiting factor on the availability of species that can be distilled. While in more equatorial regions, many plants can be grown, harvested, and distilled all year. Some species, especially trees, can be harvested all year while flowers generally have a narrow window for harvesting. I would classify knowledge of the seasonal influence into, uh, on the oils into two categories. The first would be what is traditionally known and followed by distillers. The second is what is being discovered through modern research. An example of the first type of knowledge is that roses are distilled in the spring because that's when they blossom. An example of the second type is that all monoterpene levels in salvia officinalis were found to be significantly influenced by the seasons, with eucalyptol and camphor levels remaining constant until August and then decreasing, but through Jones increasing steadily throughout the vegetative state. An example of the first type of knowledge is that the wild helichrysum is harvested when a majority of the flowers have reached maturation in late June or early July. An example of the second type of knowledge is that the oil from a species of hypericum growing in Portugal was found to have the highest levels of sesquiterpene hydrocarbons in February and the lowest levels in September. So distillers who routinely analyze their oils are able to see these various fluctuations, but it's probably not something that we will ever have any great significance for us, or even for them, because they're very practical and pragmatic about their work, meaning that they distill the plant material when they see that it's ready or when they can get it. The research, however, opens up some interesting possibilities for the production of unique oils with specialized properties for those of you who might be looking for an interesting new career. 
But there's something even more important to consider in this discussion about the seasons, which affects everyone, everywhere, whether we are interested in aromatherapy or not. So those of us who work with finished products from plants, such as essential oils or herbal ingredients, generally do not experience the seasons as directly as those who work in agriculture. Those who grow and harvest plants are acutely aware of humanity's dependency on the rhythmic order of the season and the disorder that is taking place around us. The rhythm of the seasons is changing all over the world, accompanied by increasing frequency of extreme weather. We know that. In some cases, this may have a beneficial effect on the production of some essential oils, but mostly <clears throat> what we will see is that crop losses of both foods and medicinal plants will become more common. I could give some examples of crop losses of aromatic plants over the last year that have affect the, affected the essential oil industry, but I'll just share one that Sarah and I personally we, uh, witnessed recently. And for the last several years, the production of Helichrysum italicum on Corsica has been seriously impacted by erratic and unusual weather during the spring and summer. And so I have a few video clips that I'm going to present as we go along. And this one shows one of the harvesters we spent some time with who is explaining that normally he's able to get a full handful of the immortelle flowers from every bush, but this year it requires four bushes because the bushes are usually covered heavily with flowers, but this year the plants are not producing them normally. You see, three of them here. Normally, this one, you can see through, through it with flowers. You can't, uh, you can't see through. And this year, um, flowers are not good. Mm. Not good. Look, three of them in my hand. Look. Look, this year. Three, four, flowers are here, you see, it's for that it's not good this year. So in my opinion, it's um, very important to have a holistic understanding of what goes into the creation of an essential oil, or the production of organic food, or having clean water or any other necessity of life, because with that, without that understanding, we cannot have a sense of value. And without a sense of value, we cannot appreciate. And without appreciation, we will lose our natural resources. So one of the greatest ways that plant-based medicines can help us become more spiritually mature as a culture is to be educated and sensitive to these issues and to use the plants wisely and with reverence and gratitude. So here we can consider a few points about the effects of water on plants and essential oils. So plants don't actually drink water. It's the sun that pulls the water through them. Water is taken up by the plants as passive absorption caused by the pulling force of evaporation from the column of water flowing from the plant's roots to its leaves. Plants, therefore, don't pull the water from the soil themselves. It's more accurate and more poetic to say that plants are solar-powered fountains. <laughs> water, or the lack of water, plays a major role in the production of aromatic compounds in plants. The effects are very diverse, but the most basic thing we find is that drought stress reduces the ability of plants to grow but it increases their production of secondary metabolites. In medicinal and aromatic species, this means an increase in their medicinal and aromatic compounds, either an increased overall quantity or decreased quantity, but increased relative percentage. 
of compounds. This is one of the reasons that herbalists have always felt that the wild harvested plants from the wilderness have the greatest pranic vitality. Some species, such as frankincense trees and other desert plants, are known for the high quality medicines and oils they produce in extreme conditions. Drought stress can increase the quantity of essential oils in some species and reduce the quantity in others. In some species, that can reduce the amount but increase its relative percentage, as I said. And in other species, drought stress can change the composition of the oil, and in other species, not. For example, German chamomile grown in arid conditions has decreased plant height and flower yield, but no significant effect on oil content or composition. Palmarosa and citronella increase the relative percentage of essential oil to plant material, but decrease the actual amount. In some cases, such as Iranian savory, Serious water stress during the flowering stage significantly increases the accumulation of oil more than moderate stress. And so here is another short video clip. This is a distiller in Corsica, Jean-Michel, talking about the effects of water on the helichrysum plants. So the last time we were here, yes, the spring was very late. There was a lot of rain and it was cold. Yes, yes. And now it's the opposite. It's very early. Summer is very early. It's much hotter than normal. Mm. So what happens with these different changes to the oil? What happens to the oil when there is too much rain or when there is not enough rain? Yes. Um, the effects, the effects uh, it's not the, the quality of the oil. It's the, um, uh, the quantity. Uh, if there is too much water, um, the, flower, the flowers don't grow. And um, um, if there is too much heat, um, there is much uh, oil, but it's very it's very um, um, short. The time is very short. So uh, it's uh, it's a problem. Uh, <laughs> in, the two, in the two cases, it, it's a problem. Welcome to the world of distillation. <laughs> okay, so now we can talk about the soil, okay, and so this is. When he said it was very short, does that mean that we would have to? Uh, the harvest time is very short. So you, think you, would have to really you have to get your entire team out to harvest the flowers all in two or three days because the flowers dry and degrade very quickly because of the heat. Okay. Okay, so the soil, of course, has a huge impact on the production of essential oils. The soil is the skin of the earth and uh, it has a relationship with all the other elements. It stores and purifies water and modifies the atmosphere and it's the medium for plant growth. So every essential oil that we have ever smelled has been influenced in some funda fundamental way by the soil that it came from. And we can learn how to identify these influences both through chemical and organoleptic analysis, just as a sommelier can identify the terroir of a wine. And this is a huge subject and there's little time, so I'm just going to mention um, one aspect of the soil's influence on plants and that's called the rhizosphere. So in Indian perfumery, there is an attar that is made by distilling cakes of mud into sandalwood oil. And this is known as mitti. So mitti attar is said to be the fragrance of the soil after the first monsoon rain. So I've smelled that perfume coming from the ground in many parts of the world, and I'm always reminded of a passage from the Bhagavad Gita where Krishna says, I am the fragrance of the soil. Soil is home to most of the Earth's biodiversity. One gram is said to have billions of organisms of thousands of species. These microbes are the basis of the Earth's fertility, which is the basis of all life. Maybe that is partly what Krishna meant. When the rain comes after a long period of heat and dryness, the microbial life is awakened 
maybe that is also partly what he meant. So the fragrance of the earth, which has been artistically recreated in Miti Atar and mentioned in the Indian scriptures, has now been researched for its effects on the production of essential oils. The rhizosphere is the region of soil directly influenced by root secretions that provide the habitat for soil microorganisms. The microbial life of the rhizosphere performs many important functions that nourish the plants, one of which is the production of volatile organic compounds. A number of studies have found that the compounds produced by the rhizosphere increase the growth biomass and essential oil content of aromatic plants. For example, peppermint plants exposed to the volatile organic compounds produced by various species of rhizobacterium had increased growth as well as doubling of essential oil production, indicating that those compounds induce biosynthesis of secondary metabolites and stimulate the specific steps of monoterpene metabolism. This study, like many such studies, concludes by stating the obvious, but for the wrong reasons. It says, quote, volatile organic compounds are a rich source for new natural compounds that may increase crop productivity and essential oil yield. This is code for starting new genetic engineering projects. But any gardener who knows about compost can tell you the same thing. So now, when we smell an essential oil, we can remember that it's not just the fragrance of the plants, but it's also the perfume of the living, breathing soil and the countless microscopic beings that inhabit it. We can also think again about the creative artistry of botanical intelligence that creates a finished product based on the raw materials it has to work with. So here is another topic, very briefly which is habitat variations. And this subject is very confusing and has very little practical application for us unless we're specialists, but it might increase our sense of wonder about the complexity of the field that we are working in. So in botanical taxonomy, plants are classed from family to genus to species to variety. In aromatherapy, we also encounter the term chemotype which describes the primary constituents of an oil. Chemotypes can be very different within the same species, such as thymus vulgaris having seven major types, but the term has no taxonomical meaning. It's a chemical meaning. Now, just to make things more complicated, I'll give you a new term, ecotype. Ecotype means the differences within the same species and variety of plants that are growing in different environments. So studies confirm that oils distilled from the same species growing in different locations can have different compounds, remarkably different levels of the same compounds, differences of antimicrobial effects on different strains of pathogens, and differences of antioxidant and radical scavenging activities. The same species and even same variety growing in a different location, therefore, can produce oils of, of different chemotypes, with the environment being the primary cause of the difference. For example, the same variety of Thymus algeriensis growing in eight different locations in Tunisia was found to produce five distinct chemotypes of oil. And there are some other agricultural products where we find the same thing. We find that in wine and we find that in tea. And there's also a long history in Chinese and Ayurvedic medicine of specific regions being famous for supplying the highest quality and potency of a particular herb. So one example of this in the world of essential oils that I'm familiar with and um, that Sarah and I have recently returned from a big adventure with is the Helichrysum italicum. And this species is cultivated in numerous places in Europe, but the best oil is reputed to come from Corsica and the reputation is generally attributed to the soil and the climate, so it's an ecotype, okay? So it's Helichrysum metallicum Corsica ecotype. And so here is Jean-Michel, again, describing <coughs> some of the therapeutic differences between the immortelle harvested from three different ecosystems. This is fascinating. This is very specific therapeutic differences. And he mentions the immortelle from the sea. 
What that means is that they went and uh, they went to a special marine preserve where there's um, a uh, particular helichrysum that is growing there that's different than other parts of the island. So it's not of the sea like he's distilling seaweed. It's helichrysum from the coast is what he's saying. Now you are distilling the uh, immortel from the, from the sea. From the sea. Yes. What is different about that? Uh, um, immortel from the sea is like uh, immortel from the valley. I see. It's better for all the pains, chronic, chronic pains. Uh -huh. um, en fait, in fact, the, the, there is three three types types kind of immortel uh, cultured, uh, wild, wild from the valley, and wild from the mountain. Um, um, the mountain is better for the skin of the face. Uh, sea and valley is better for the, the pains and the, the culture is better for uh, the bruise. I see. Uh. Interesting. Yeah, and very so, helpful. Uh, the immortel uh, from the sea uh, is good too for the bruise and the pain but uh, it, pre uh, it prefers the skin, okay? Uh, the, um, the valet is good for the bruise, the skin, but it prefers the chronic pain. And the cultured is better for um, skin, pain, but it prefers bruise. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The secret oral transmission. <laughs> It's confusing, isn't it? <laughs> cultivated. Cultured means cultivated. The ones they, they grow in the plantations. There's two types of wild, high altitude, low altitude. Altitude is another factor. And then there's a type that they're not growing in the farms. Okay? All right. You find this interesting? Yes. All right, now, let's imagine that we are the size of this creature which is a bean weevil living on the surface of the plant. So if we uh, took a walk around, we would find giant mouths that open and close. The stomata, inhaling carbon dioxide and exhaling oxygen. We would find pollen grains and plant hairs, probably other creatures, and we would also find various types of glandular structures that secrete and store essential oils. Now let's imagine that we could sample the oils that are stored in various types of glands on various parts of the same plant, say clary sage. So if we were wandering around on the clary sage flower, we would find primarily what are called capitate glands, which would be filled mainly with linalool and linalool acetate, which are monoterpenes and scleriol, which is a diterpene. If we were wandering around on the surface of the leaves, we would find peltate glands, which accumulate sesquiterpenes. What we would discover, therefore, is that different regions of the plant have different types of glands, and different types of glands produce different types of compounds. Now, if we were to look even more closely, what we would find is that inside, even the same type of gland on the same part of the plant, there is a tremendous difference in the composition of the oil. So if we look at it from this perspective, an aromatic plant appears to be covered with millions of tiny droplets. Each of these droplets is a distilled essence of all the cosmological and environmental influences that have been acting on the plant and its responses to those influences. We then put a ton of the plant material covered with trillions of microscopic star-like droplets into the still and they all burst, contributing their unique scent to the whole finished oil. So now we come to the influence of humans. We can look at this briefly uh, because um, 
everything changes with the touch of humans, for better or worse. There are many human influences that we can perceive in an essential oil. We can sum these up as all the agricultural factors, such as planting, harvesting, and everything in between, and all the distillation factors, including the equipment and the type of extracting method. All of these steps will make a huge impact on the finished product. So when we are smelling a fine, high-quality oil, we are smelling the care and intelligence and experience and knowledge that went into it. Likewise, when we smell a low-quality oil, we can perceive the odors of things that have gone wrong or have not been done well. For example, vetiver oil should not smell like Icelandic smoked lamb. <laughs> but sometimes it does because the bottom of the primitive, a primitive still was burned from a wood fire. Likewise, all the quality control issues of this complex industry, especially adulteration of oils with synthetic aroma compounds, are all human actions in chemical form that can have toxic effects on others. An essential oil, therefore, is a reflection of the consciousness that went into its production, from planting the seeds to the final aging of the oil. And the reason that I am discussing human consciousness here is because rapid developments are taking place in the field of biotechnology, specifically genetic modifications of medicinal and aromatic plants. A lot of people are not aware of this, so bear with me. If you spend time reading the medical databases, you will find fascinating reports that give a glimpse into the working of this industry. For example, you might find the report titled Upregulation of an N-terminal truncated 3-hydroxy-3-methylglutaryl-CoA reductase enhances production of essential oils and sterols in transgenic lavandula latifolia where you would learn that, quote, modifications of yield and composition of this essential oil by genetic engineering should have an important scientific and commercial application. This tells us that transgenic lavender is already a reality. So if you want something less technical, you could read the report titled Genetic Engineering of Peppermint for Improved Essential Oil Composition and Yield. This report concludes with the uplifting words, quote, these experiments have led to a systematic approach for the creation of a super peppermint. This tells us that if we are not, if it's not already finding its way into consumer products, GM mint oil soon will, transgenic mint. It would be tempting to spend time on this subject as it's so full of rich contradictions and topics that people feel passionately about. But this talk is about botanical intelligence. So I'm going to limit my comments to one simple observation. MRSA and other forms of resistance to antibiotics are the natural result of humans attempting to dominate microbial intelligence with our own. Likewise, we see the same mentality and results in agriculture with pesticides and herbicides. Transgenic crops represent a different form of the same well-intentioned ignorance. We have tried unsuccessfully to kill off pathogenic microbes and other un unwanted forms of life. With biotech methods, we are now attempting to change plants from highly intelligent organisms that use their metabolism to adapt to the changing conditions of the environment into genetically programmed machines that produce chemicals. So our role in this drama is the same as with transgenic foods, to be advocates of sane agriculture and freedom from political corruption and to economically support those dedicated to producing foods and medicines uncontaminated by both the mentality and the toxins that pervade the biotech industry. Aromatherapy as part of non-toxic medicine and healing is an integral part of this movement toward a more enlightened relationship with first ourselves and then with nature. Now we come to the final topic. 
of the greatest celestial, terrestrial, and cosmological factor of all. So while the sun is the most powerful celestial influence in our galactic neighborhood, time encompasses the entire universe in its flow. There are many influences of time that can be found in essential oils, and some of them are primary factors that determine the quality, aroma, and therapeutic benefits of those oils. In most cases, these influences can be seen on a chromatograph and observed through smell, so we can learn to perceive the effects of time on an oil. I'll mention just a few examples briefly in order to spend more time on some of my favorites. The, the time of planting, transplanting, and harvesting and the length of day all affect the production of essential oils. These are matters that concern agricultural researchers and producers of aromatic crops. The length of time that a plant is distilled affects the yield of oil, the oil's composition, its antioxidant properties, and its antimicrobial powers. These are matters that concern distillers and buyers who want specific kinds of oils. The age of an essential oil concerns all of us working in the field of aromatherapy. If you have distilled oils, you know that many come out of the still with a similar distinct grassy, herbaceous, and vegetative aroma, which dissipates, dissipates over a period of a few days to a couple of weeks. So here is Steffi, another Corsican distiller, discussing the aging of essential oils. It's too fresh, you don't smell. You don't smell at the beginning. When was this distilled this morning? Yesterday. Yesterday? Yesterday. So this is 24 hours old? Yes, yes. And it smells very different than in one month. You don't smell it. As you, I know. If you, you do it, you, afterwards you don't go and say, I'm going to test it. You can't test it now. At least wait one week and then you smell. So many Because oil? it's too fresh. Uh, all essential oils. So it's always the same. So fresh distilled essential oils, usually they, they stink. They need some repos. It means they need some... Uh, Time to settle. Time to settle. Yeah. Basically, because of the composition, like a perfume, for example, if you make mix uh, essential oils for a perfume, I'm not a perfumer, but I know this. Um, it takes you mix it and you leave it. You forget about it. Some of you may have made the mistake that I've made of throwing out a perfectly good oil because I didn't recognize that it just needed more time to age. On the other hand. Some of us may be so fond of our oils that we keep them long past the time they have dangerously oxidized. <laughs> and a few of us may have a collection of rare aromatic treasures that have been getting better for centuries, that we found in grandma's attic or on eBay or in a bazaar in Cairo where we for sure bought the last of the extinct blue lotus oil that came from the Pharaoh's tomb. <laughs> to conclude our little presentation here, uh, here are a couple of my favorite stories about the effects of time on essential oils. So earlier I defined botanical intelligence as the evolutionary functions of secondary metabolism and how that allow the plants to adapt and survive. I mentioned that one of the best examples was the ability to use chemical signaling to communicate with other species. I also told the story of how flowering plants came to dominate the earth, which created the ecological conditions for humans to emerge. What I didn't tell you was how the angiosperms became the most successful of the phylum. It was through the development of an entirely new reproductive strategy, which symbiotically uses other species for pollination. Therefore, a flower signaling with both color and aromatic molecules to pollinators can be said to be one of the highest expressions of plant intelligence that has had the biggest impact on life on Earth for the last hundred million years. So think of that the next time you smell a flower oil, such as lavender or rose. 
The signaling of flowers to pollinators using aromatic molecules is a very large subject and a lot is still unknown. Most of the research is highly technical and focused on the genetics or the metabolic pathways for commercial purposes. So I'll just give you a very brief summation of how I understand and like to view this unique aspect of aromatherapy. In the early stages of its development, a flower does not emit aromatic molecules. First comes the bud stage and the development of pigment molecules. As the flower opens, it begins to synthesize aromatic molecules in different locations depending on the species and the pollinator it wishes to attract. The metabolic pathways that produce arom aroma compounds are not completely understood, but in some cases it appears that the fragrance molecules are synthesized out of pigment molecules. So in this case, we could poetically say the scent evolves from light. As we know, some but not all flowers open and close following the diurnal cycle of the sun. The emission of aromatic molecules does not necessarily follow this pattern either. Some flowers have long phases of emitting aromas, some have short. Some emit fragrance in the morning, some at night, some at midday. So why does the night blooming jasmine bloom at night? Only it knows, but it probably has to do with a symbiotic relationship with nocturnal creatures. What we do know are two important and fascinating things. The first is that flowers emit aromatic molecules in a cyclical rhythm that slowly increases in intensity and then gradually subsides. The second is that every flower has a different diffusivity range. Okay, so let me go back and put this in. So you can see here, this is the biorhythmic emission. Okay. So the second is that every flower has a different diffusivity range, meaning how far its orb of aromatic molecules extends. So how does this appear to a creature that has a relationship with a particular flower? I imagine that it is like an invisible spherical aura that slowly expands and contracts, a kind of perfume primordial pulsation promising entomological pleasure. The pulsation of floral aromatics has obvious reproductive purposes, which we experience as the pleasure and eroticism of perfumery. But it goes more deeply than that. If we consider the nature of how flowers are communicating, we see that this pulsation of this aromatic aura follows the same fundamental pattern as all other aspects of life. It's the same as the inhalation and the exhalation of the breath. It's the same as the heartbeat. It's the same as the galactic sound of a star pulsating. So there's one more topic to touch on in this discussion, which is the distillation of time itself. When we smell oils from flowers, we are smelling the moment in time when the flower opened and sent out its fragrance. We could even say that oils from flowers are distilled impermanence, captured at the peak of their beauty and fullness before they fade away an hour or a day later. It's intriguing to note that the flower oils, which are essentially distilled biorhythms, are known for restoring regularity to human biorhythms through contact with the limbic system. But when we smell the oils from old trees, such as old sandalwood or the old cedars of the Moroccan mountains or an ancient juniper, we are smelling the aroma of accumulated age 
the perfume of decades or even centuries. This is time that was distilled, first by the tree itself, and in that oil that we distilled are all the years of life that have accumulated in the heartwood and the roots of all the days and moons and seasons and weather that the tree has witnessed and felt. For me, this is another wonderful contemplation that deepens our appreciation for the sanctity of the natural world and another way that aromatherapy can heal us of our disconnection from it. So, thank you. This has been a production of Floricopia. Visit us at floricopia.com for more courses like this and to experience the world's finest essential oils.